car is always dangerous. The winter is coming. I'm getting lost in the details of nothing. Remember the first time you saw Star Wars? We were still living at your mom's house. The pilot. When Adam's ex-girlfriend Corey moves back to Holliston, he is devastated to learn that she has a boyfriend, Kevin, who is successful, gorgeous, wealthy, and everything that Adam is not. Adam tries to prove to Corey that he too has moved on. This is Season 1, Episode 1 of Holliston, The Hooker, and you are channel surfing with the bargain bin. Description from IMDb, we will not be holding back on spoilers. I am Sandro, and I am joined, as always, by my podcast partner in crime, Ben, and our neighbor downstairs, Mark. So, what did we think? Guys, this show. I, I, I can't hide my love for this show. Um, before I get into why, uh, Sandro, I know that you have been a fan of some of the episodes, if not all. But Mark, this is your intro to the series. What, what is your overall take on, <laughs> on Holliston episode one? We'll get into some like, specific points, but overall, coming from Tulsa King... What uh, what are your thoughts? It is a far cry from Tulsa King, but uh, <laughs> I, it's welcome. Uh, I can laugh again, so I feel good about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's nice. I like it. You you guys introduced me to this and mentioned something about it's it's two horror writers that write some kind of comedy, and kind of, and it's this hybrid thing that I had no idea what I was getting into, and I'm glad you pulled me into it. So thank you. It's awesome. I'm I'm glad, dude. Because yeah, you're you're right. This is. Um, horror directors Adam Green and Joe Lynch playing struggling horror directors Adam Green and Joe Lynch <laughs> working at uh, a public access cable company which is what Adam did when he was younger and uh, they would steal gear when the, the, the company was closed for the night and try and make their horror films uh, which I, we will get into in another episode but this is so autobiographical i don't know where the lines are blurred and it's just so the whole thing is so fucking funny like yeah it, a works. lot of it has to be real yeah and it has to because it has to relate to them in some way right i mean when whenever you watch a comedy or any kind of thing it's something relatable we all struggled we all and you, you were you're in film and and in that kind of world you know mm -hmm. what it's like trying to get the resources together you know struggling oh yeah well it I just, I just hope the relationship between, uh, is it, is it not Adam? It's Joe, right? Between Joe and his girlfriend, I hope that one's a little more, a little less real than like it, than like it was on the show. <laughs> yeah, I was like, we got to get her out of there. <laughs> Joe and Laura and Adam and Corey, uh, Corey. the the exes anyway. Don't forget Riley with uh, D. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Rocket. <laughs> Uh, okay, I love that you brought that up. Okay, one of my favorite things about the show is the supporting characters. Um, we have the owner of the cable station, uh, Lance Rocket, played by D. Snyder, uh, who was actually really good friends with Joe Lynch's father in real life. They were like, they were just all about motorcycles and would talk all the time. Uh, Adam's imaginary best friend who lives in his bedroom closet is Odorous Arungus, Canada's own Dave Brocky, R.I.P., from Guar. The guy from Guar. He's so funny. Everybody in the show is actually funny. Even the people that you're supposed to dislike are hilarious. Guar has been around. I remember Guar when I was just getting into college or just leaving high school, and that would have been the late 80s or early 90s. Yeah, it would have been um, Scumdogs. Oh my yeah, gosh. Scum dogs was... would have been out around then. What uh, what did you think about uh, the chemistry between Adam and Joe? They know each other forever. Right? They de they definitely agree. I I think who sh once again shining D Snyder's great. D Snyder seems to not care about a gosh darn thing about in the world. That guy no. must be the funnest hang ever. He's so willing to make fun of himself and play a fool on camera. He's done Mass Singer. He's done The Apprentice. He's done every, all of these shows. He challenges himself to do something completely out of his comfort zone, and he he shines. He just steps up every time. Yeah, I 
I saw him in Toronto. I went to his uh, like D. Snyder's rock and roll Christmas musical thing that he did, and he was just the narrator for it. He wasn't actually in it, and you could tell even then he was having a blast doing it night after night after night. He's a showman. He's got energy. Exactly. Um, I did want to mention too that the the late night cable show that Adam and Joe run, where they're talking about Pet Cemetery and the whole Maureen Lipschitz thing. Uh, the show is called The Movie Crypt. And that is the actual name of the podcast that the two of them do. And anybody listening who's interested in horror films, not the movies themselves, but the creative process and how they're made, I highly recommend checking it out. It's great. That's cool to know. Yeah. And this this show is such a contrast to what we just finished up with Tulsa King. Tulsa King, cinematic drama. Here we're getting a three camera sitcom. And I've always had a problem trying to describe the show to people. Uh, the best thing I could come up with sounds like a horrible insult to the show. And that is that Holliston is the Big Bang Theory made for horror fans. Oh, that's pretty nice. You think? I, I, I would call it a rich man's wings world in a weird way. And, and I don't mean that you guys sit on a couch. I just mean it the interaction and the comedy that erupts from that, I guess. Yeah. And and I don't mean that to trivialize that because Wayne's World was so influential in our in our lives as well. I I could see this kind of being an SNL sketch. Yeah, I really could. I guess maybe that's that's probably a broader way to say that. Maybe more of a maybe Second City kind of thing, or who knows, right? Sketch like a yeah. sketch comedy piece. But but it works well because they keep refreshing. It's not like a skit like Saturday Night Live where after five minutes it's gone too long. This is this was entertaining all throughout. It's, I think it's the quick cuts that really do it because they'll, the scene will, a scene will be playing out for a, a specific duration. And after maybe like 45 to 60 seconds in, they'll make a reference and then it'll be a snap cut to a shot of people acting out what they were just talking about. And it just keeps the momentum going. So you never really feel like something's dragging on too long. And for a 40 minute sitcom episode, it's surprising that nothing in this episode drags. No, it wasn't. And it's almost like they, cause they almost laugh at themselves in between them, in between yeah. those little pieces. It's each one's like its own little skit in a way. And there are callbacks to previous jokes. Oh, for sure. And I, I need to ask like the hottest Riley is the only one I can think of from alien, right? <laughs> or but that's Ripley, I guess it's not even a Riley. I don't even know a hot Riley. I don't Just, know a Riley on either side. I'm sure there are many hot Rileys out there. There are plenty of hot Shawns. I know that. Oh, God, yes. Sides. Of course there are. Anyway. Um, but, uh, Sandro, your uh, original take on Holliston when I, uh, when I first introduced you to the show. Are you insane? Do you expect me to remember my original take? That was <laughs> years ago. How about this for a take, okay? You know my... Uh, my inability to watch things multiple times. Prior to doing The Bargain Bin, I seldom watch something more than once. I have watched this series fully through two times, which is big for me. And yeah. I'm more than happy to watch it a third time. And I'm enjoying it as, I mean, technically we've watched this episode four times now. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy it all. I do find it funny, though, because we talked about it in the past with Mark, where he mentioned, oh... You can tell if an actor is not good at what they do if they have to use their own real name. <laughs> the only, <laughs> and the only member of the main cast that doesn't use his name is, is Dee Snyder. Snyder. The rest of the them actual all actor. use their own first name. <laughs> I love that, though. I love it so much. That's a good point. But yeah, like I, I first discovered this 11 years ago, 2012. Wow. And... I ended up buying both seasons from iTunes at the time. When was and it released? Was it released in 12 or when was it released? Uh, 2012 and 2013. Okay. And uh, so I bought them both digitally and then I found out they had DVD and Blu-ray releases. So I bought both on Blu-ray and I, I watched them all the time. Sandro even bought me uh, one of the Holliston comic books from Adam Green's website and it's hilarious. Oh, very cool. But uh, get, getting back to this episode, episode one, The Hooker, um, were there any I didn't scenes? Even know that was the name of the episode. When you said that, I'm like, it is? <laughs> it makes sense. It totally does, but it's like three minutes of the entire thing. Were there uh, any scenes that stood out to either of you? Yeah. 
the intro of D Snyder was great. The intro of the girlfriend was great. Um, just the the hooker was funny. Uh, yeah, and then the one that we laughed for minutes, and I won't talk about that one because you guys, I'm t- I'm still in the spotlight <laughs> here, so I will let both of you share that one. Okay, um, we will definitely get to that. I I, <laughs> I agree. D Snyder as Lance Rocket, his whole scene with the whole Riley thing is hilarious. The show is done so well that like they got way too much comedy play out of Joe washing out a condom. Like that one scene, you should be like, oh, that's gross. Let's move on. But they play it out and it's actually funny. You know what? It's because he washed it. Yeah. That was very sanitary. I was, I was impressed by the amount of scrubbing that was going on there. That obviously was playing into the joke about them being broke and cheap and whatever. Yeah. But then there's a scene later when Adam comes out of his room and he's going to tell Joe that he's going to get a hooker. And Joe's just holding the condom and twirling it around <laughs> his fingers <laughs> for no reason at all. It's like, he couldn't have just been cleaning it again. And this was the night after the date. He's and, just and then, me, Sandra. And then when Adam says that he wants to talk, Joe just puts it in the box and closes it up again. It's like, well, what were you doing with it that time? And he's like, I'm in the box. Yeah, like, it's, it's an so Altoid he's in. Yes, he's pulling but guys, remember it's okay if it, you can use it two or three times as long as if it's with the same girl. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ax- <laughs> Axel the cat is something that I feel bad for laughing at all of the time, but it's just an animatronic cat that apparently has feline Down syndrome, and as such, just shits everywhere. Yet it doesn't go anywhere. It, it doesn't it go. Just happen to have shat everywhere. It just it, doesn't move. It can't move. I know that's the great it's thing about it. A it's wonderful sight everywhere, gag. but it can't move. <laughs> um. So yeah, I we should kind of cover that. Like, yeah, a- Adam and Joe live together. Uh, Joe is dating Laura. Adam is obsessed over his ex girlfriend Corey, who's moved away. But then Laura lets it slip that she's moved back because she's now got a nursing job at the local hospital. Um. What do you think about Adam breaking up with uh, Deanna? It was a bit of a rash move, um, but his actual explanation was on it. point. Uh, definitely got the message across. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I love that his original reason was that he can't date somebody who hasn't seen Gremlins. I haven't seen Gremlins. She doesn't know the rules. It's dangerous. <laughs> well, I'm not dating you now, am I? Well, now we know why. Exactly. <laughs> Well, on on that point, though, uh, to be clear, on that point, I, it's going to call me out as a misogynist. But until I saw the end, <laughs> I had no issue with him breaking up with her. <laughs> Dude, um, I mean, she was gorgeous, and she seemed like she had her head on straight. I'm just saying, like until meeting her character, I well, didn't know who she was. The thing you will find out about Adam is that he is the master of self sabotage. Oh, we see that how he takes care of himself after failing yeah. a couple of times. But I really want to talk about the set of the show. Um, for them being so poor and penny pinching, that is a massive apartment, a massive two bedroom apartment. And I love it because the whole thing looks like it's falling apart. And <laughs> you would, that would still be probably over two grand here. So oh, wow. I, would, I would love to know what, what they're supposedly paying. Well, this was paying in 2010 or 11, 12, also or 12, 13. So, yeah. Moving to another set, though, of Casey's Crossing, where we spend a fair amount of time in the episode. Um, it feels like every sitcom has the hangout spot yeah. where a lot of the episodes will have the cast come together, which you don't really need in this because they're all great friends and hang out at the apartment. But, Mark, what, what's your stance on Casey's Crossing? I, I Personally, I think it's a. Uh, a nice refresh so we get a bit of a a scene change so i will say this i did watch this specific episode one time per your recommendation before we had talked about doing this completely Mm -hmm. so but i've not watched any since so what i know of it now is i didn't even see it like a seinfeldian diner scene i saw Mm -hmm. it just as a place to meet up the two couples i really thought it was i didn't see it yet as a hang so it might show up later you that you might know about that i don't all right, fair enough. So I'm happy to show my naivete about that. Here we also meet um, Sandra's favorite character, Kevin. <laughs> Ken. <laughs> Ken. 
Corey's uh, doctor boyfriend. Like Barbie's coming out too, just just in time. Yeah. Um, guys, thoughts on Kevin? He just sits and smiles, <laughs> staring off into space. <laughs> There's so many times where they're in the middle of a conversation, and the camera cuts to him. He's just looking off at a wall or something like that. But there must be the funniest thing on the wall ever, because he is just smiling from ear to ear. It is the perfect example of a character that is just a placeholder. <laughs> Don't give him any personality. He just needs to be there for, like, a roadblock for somebody until he's not needed, and then we'll get rid of him. That's how it comes it's, across. It's like they literally made him the token character and told everybody, this is absolutely this token character that we threw in. But I think he, that guy just literally went to medical school so he can kill people. Jesus. I, that, guy's, that, has, that guy is like, that smile is a smile of a psychopath, my friend. It's definitely a Patrick Bateman scenario. There you go. Um, <laughs> Evan, it's so awesome. Hi, guys. I think Spe Stepford Husband, was it? Is that what? <laughs> that's what you called him, a Stepford Husband. <laughs> and that's a very, very good, very good tag. Um, I want to say one thing, and that is, as funny as the show is, I find that, and Mark, you will find this too as we go through the season. Um, there's very honest humanity in some of these characters and they just play it up to make it as comedic as possible. But I think Adam and his longing for Corey is something that we see in dramas all the time and they play it fully serious. And here we just kind of need to take a, a comedic snap on it. But I think the realism to his longing for somebody who doesn't really feel the same anymore he's just latched on to this one period of his life really kind of anchors holliston to um well for me in a, a realistic human emotion which is just shit all over for the rest of the season i can't wait for you to see that <laughs> but do you find that there's some elements of the show that are a little heavier than the rest i think they're all heavy topics seen with a very extreme light yeah this to them so that's a great way of putting it. Every, almost everything in that episode entirely, including the one that we'll talk about, that one not exactly, but something very similar to that, of course, <laughs> has happened in our lives. Almost <laughs> all, everything. I've, you know, I've felt that bad about myself staring at myself in a mirror going, why did you do that? And, you know, whatever. <laughs> that was the worst that I saw, but it was still pretty funny because it just was so extreme. It was so bad. I've had that moment. A mirror moment? Yeah. Oh, yeah. When I was in high school, you guys might not know this, and people from our promo picks might not know this, but I had, like, braided hair down to my chin. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I was just so distraught one day that I went into the bathroom and came out bald. Wow. Went home from school on Friday with long braided hair, came in with no hair on Monday. That must have been a change for people, huh? And for yourself. Pretty dark, man. That's just hair, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Little did I know that nature was going to take care of the rest for me after that. <laughs> should, should have held on to it as long as I could have. I guess he doesn't want it anyway. Yeah, there you go. We'll zap it off him. Um, what do you guys think of uh, Odorous? He was fun. I, I love that character in this show. I liked how he had the two voices, because he had the guy who kind of did this, and then he had the must be the real voice. When the really that clean softer, speaking. Yeah, the real yeah. normal speaking. So that was fun. The the overall plot of the show is fucked up. And that Adam is embarrassed that he's not doing well and he's single. Joe talks Corey into going on a double date, her and Kevin and Adam and his girlfriend, which he doesn't have, Riley. And he, or not Riley. What was her name? Deanna. Deanna or something. Deanna. So <laughs> This is where the title of the episode comes in, and uh, Adam hires a, uh, a sex worker to pose as his girlfriend. This woman is a disaster. Um, I don't know, like, there, there are obvious lines here that I, was, I couldn't hold my laughter in, but lines like, we met at a fundraiser I put on for children with bad cancer. <laughs> it's not just the line, too. Her delivery on it is perfect, because she's actually delivering it like she's like, Oh, what was that script he gave me? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole scene is a nightmare. I love it so much. It's so uncomfortable. But not like awkward uncomfortable. It's just 
you know it's going to get worse with every line and you're kind of excited for it. What's that thing about acting is like you have to believe it for it to work. She clearly yeah. believed that she were she met him at a charity for bad cancer. <laughs> bad cancer. <laughs> Obviously, it's a long premiere episode, a long pilot. So Adam and Corey, the uh, former lovers, are going to have to make up or bond at some point, And they do that. Meanwhile, leaving Joe inside to drink coffee and just stall. Um, Mark, the scene you were talking about that I, I laughed for probably three minutes straight. I think we all muted. Yeah. Um, Adam just saying, and the line being, this sucks. This sucks worse than the Halloween when I threw up in my mask. <laughs> cut, cut to problem. <laughs> it's, cut to problem. It's, it's three seconds. It's the funniest fucking shit I've seen in a long time. Oh my god. <laughs> you know how like frogs like before they spit their venom their whole thing goes like blows up underneath and like their their throat gets all raw. Yeah. That's exactly what that reminded me of. And it was like a was it like some weird Frankenstein mask? Yeah, I yeah, can't even know what kind of mask it was. The best part about it is that this show has a laugh track, which I hate. But it it is kind of charming as you go on. They didn't they refrain from using it for this one scene. And it made it so much more impactful. <laughs> Stop! I, if you start, I can't see. Just, I don't know. <laughs> oh god! Like the mask didn't even have holes in it. <laughs> you think they come out? They didn't even breathe. <laughs> It's so, so stupid that we're laughing this <laughs> <It's just> so good. <sighs> oh my gosh, that was a great uh, one. And it's yeah. weird because it's like so stupid. But I'm crying so again. funny. So funny. Oh god. Okay. Well done. Well done, gentlemen. Hey, All right, hey. everybody collect themselves. <sighs> All right, dry my eyes, dry my eyes. <sighs> yes. All right. So, yeah, of course, uh, as any pilot episode does, everything works out for the most part in the end, and we're just basically set up for the next episode. Um, Sandro, what, uh, what do you have to say on this? So this is actually a very interesting episode if we talk about the show from a structural standpoint, because mm -hmm. it is our introduction to all of the characters. So the actual plot of the, the episode in and of itself is a very shortened version of what the series plot is going to be. Yep. You get the background for, you know, they're constantly fighting their lack of funds, the obsession with Corey, the relationship between Laura and Joe. Like, we're getting... If you actually go and look at all of the episodes from the show as a whole, mm -hmm. this one will actually look like it doesn't have a plot because it's setting the groundwork for everything that ends up becoming the overarching plot that's just kind of a complementary piece to what the individual episodes later become. I agree completely. Um, Did you guys watch their How to Make a Show? Is that, is that what you guys, where you guys know stuff? No, no, we just... That was so deep. That was beautiful analysis. What I was saying is that with every show, I tell people you have to give it at least the first three episodes before you can have an informed decision on whether or not you think the show is going to be good or not, because it's, there's always a rocky period. You need to work out a storyline. You need to work out the characters. So for most shows that are running like 44 minute episodes, give it the first three and then make up your mind. Yay or nay. Holliston does all of that in 39 minutes. And I find that amazing because with this one episode, Sandra, you're right. The plot is almost non-existent. What they're doing is they're giving you every bit of background information you need and then bam season two or episode two let's go and not many shows can do that but when you've got two hollywood screenwriter directors i mean these guys have been doing this as a career we should not be surprised but if you don't know their background this is a very welcome breath of fresh air they they seem very competent i mean they have us hooked I'm I'm yeah. hooked. I I definitely am watching it. I I don't want to compare it to other sitcoms, but I find that this show could probably be watched individually in random order without it affecting other stuff as much as other shows might. 
Is that is that a fair assumption? Um, for the most part, yeah, I think you're you're right. I would um, say that if you've seen the whole series, you'll know that there's a couple of bookend episodes. Okay, um, because they do address the overarching plot. Right. But everything in the middle could be watched in any random order, and that's the the biggest compliment I can give to this show is that they get all of this origin introduction stuff out of the way in the first episode and they actually do it if you sit back and look at it in a very cookie cutter by the numbers way however they do it with humor and proper pacing so that never feels like they're just going down the checklist Mm -hmm. but as the show continues you see that evolution of lance coming in when they're recording an episode odor odor is giving advice to um adam which i think is absolutely the greatest character to be giving the the, like sage (laughs) advice in the series but you know what i mean like they're they're getting this out of the way but they they don't feel like they're just you know going through the motions when on paper that's what this would look like so they know how to make it entertaining and they also know how to do it quick concise get it out of the way and then episode two we can just hit the ground running it's so organic yeah, they do it so well because the truth is, let's be honest, the budget for the, you know, for the scenery and all the everything else is nothing. So mm-hmm. it's clearly, you know, you can't really put lipstick on it. So it has to have sub- substance and it clearly does. It's It was masked beautifully to, to have that kind of strength to it. Yeah. And being having individual uh, episodes that could stand on their own, that does speak to the strength of a, of writing as well. It was a really fun episode. Okay, so obviously there isn't as much to touch on in that regard. So I'm going to ask you guys, excluding the one scene. <laughs> what scene's that? that? <laughs> don't, don't do it, Ben. <laughs> excluding the one scene, which I think we would all agree on, what was your other highlight of the episode? Because we got to have something a little bit more than the one. <laughs> don't uh, start that again. Uh, um... It's tough, man. Um, I really enjoyed uh, Laura's introduction uh, because it immediately established the the relationship between the three. The fact that Axel's shitting everywhere. Uh, it shows us that Laura is an artist, and that's never referenced again in this episode, but it does come up throughout the season. So she's already set up, and it seems like a one off scenario. You see, like them bickering about Joe eating Adam's peanut butter because they're so stingy. Um, but then at the same time, there's there's just I, I think it might be a different scene actually, but where uh, where Joe tells Adam to take the Blu-ray player money to hire the the woman for the the double date. Yeah, that's it's, way later. That's when he's going to hire the hooker. Yeah, but it's a throwback to like the stinginess of it. Um. I just love seeing where these people exist. Um, there, there's just there's way too many scenes to pick to have as like potential favorites, like D. Snyder and his exit. Mark, whenever he exits, you're gonna laugh probably because I don't know if you noticed he he's basically states like, um, "You've been great. We've been diver down. Good night." Yeah. something along yeah. those lines. And then he backs out the door, and the door just closes on its own. <sighs> Is he in a Van Halen cover band? Is that the whole point yeah, of that? D- Diver Down. <laughs> right. It, that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's stuff from Diver Down. Right. Oh my God. Yeah. That's great. Um, but I like I love I love the setting of the apartment and getting us, you know, more grounded with these characters in that environment. I love I, I could do without Casey's crossing as much as we will get it later. Um having i think it could set almost the entire show in this apartment i love it i just i love that set i love that that's where we see these characters open up to each other um it sounds kind of like a generic explanation but that's it for me um mark what about you what is your favorite scene other I than was, well, highlights it doesn't have to be a highlight, scene it could be a liner and yeah, yeah, sure. performance i i it's it's i think it's adam um because adam speaks to every insecurity that i have Mm -hmm. Um, and basically how much I hate myself. And when I look in a mirror and I talk to myself, I want to just cut my my chest apart or pick my face off. It's just beautiful. So he likes to really, (laughs) really just over the top yell at himself for nothing. 
is very and self-deprecating. I, and, and, and the self-deprecation to me, it's a comedian's dream. It's just easy. It just softens everything. You can't yell at somebody who yells at themselves that much. So, Sandro? Uh, it's actually a scene that you referenced off episode, or not scene, moment, and it is that non-laugh track guy who shouts out, oh, <laughs> he said the name of the show and the city. I'm a big <laughs> fan of that. I know that it's kind of a cheap pop for a lot of things, but I love it when a TV show or a movie references the name. I love it when a, an artist has a song on their album that actually says the album name on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I just really like that. So they do it in a way in this episode that is actually pretty funny, too. And I caught that the first time I saw this episode is that this is just before the Laura introduction, which I mean, of course, Laura is a highlight as well. Yeah, we forgot everything after that happened. When, when that guy just shouts that out, I'm like, it, it, it's, it's kind of telling because this show is not afraid to break the fourth wall randomly and for no reason at all. It even yeah. happens later in the episode when Adam is talking to Corey and he's just like, I'm just upset that we recast you for season two, right? Like they are not afraid to poke fun at themselves or at modern conventions or cliches. And that one is kind of one of the earliest that we just get right in your face. Definitely. Yeah, they're comfortable in that. It's kind of like the weird thing where, you know, people are comfortable in certain awkward positions. They just lean into it. And I think that they know where they can get away with doing it. So they do it in places where it totally works. I've got um, an honorable mention highlight of the episode that I, for I forgot to mention earlier. And that is at Casey's Crossing when Adam calls Joe and out of desperation. He's like, I need you to create a distraction. I need you to come help me get me out of here. And Joe runs into the bar. <laughs> He's like... Dude, I'm so glad I found you. We need to get back to the apartment right away. And I was like, why? What's wrong? And Joe just goes, the cat's wicked depressed. <laughs> and Adam, super serious face, goes, sounds serious. Let's go. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous, but played so straight. I love it. I, speaking of that point, right before Laura's eating the peanut butter, he takes it out of her hand or out of her hands. And then doesn't give it back to her when he leaves the apartment. He just puts it, leaves it on the table. It's like, come on, man. Just hand yeah, her back the peanut butter. It's definitely a, a, a different show than what we did last season. It's true. Because like, it's really true. Like They lean into the things. Like Sometimes we don't pay 100% attention to our partners, right? Like They lean into how bad it is or how moochy we can be or how you know yeah. all the shortcomings we have. They really accentuate and they become... Uh, caricature like so we can laugh at them at that point. exactly and i think that's well the done. beauty of halston as a whole is that it knows what it is it's not trying to be any kind of different show it's not trying to fit itself into a certain box if it makes sense for the episode to provide a laugh or to critique or provide a satire it will do it nothing is really off limits but at the same time they know their limits mm -hmm. I think you said it perfectly. All right. So we don't really have a ranking uh, yet because we've only had one episode. So it will clearly be both first and last currently. But <laughs> let's find out what happens with the next episode. <laughs> 